Today, the roller coaster ride continues. The Property Imperative Weekly to the 9th of November 2019. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In this week's digest, we look at the ups and downs of the US markets as trade talk breakthroughs turn sour. The yield curve continued to behave more normally, even as the Fed pumped in yet more liquidity. And locally, the RBA's latest statement on monetary policy took growth prospects lower a bit but continue to talk up the economy. Meantime, the results from some of the big banks here were down more than expected. And of course, there is less than a week to go before submissions to the Senate are closed on the cash transaction ban. So if you want to have your say, there is not long to go. And I'm going to start with the international context first. But if you want to jump to the Australian section, the time is shown below. And in the comments below, we list out the main topics we'll discuss today. Stocks had gone higher on Thursday when officials from both countries said that the United States and China had agreed to rolling back the trade tariffs. The chance of getting tariffs removed, as media reports discussed, is much more optimistic than anything we've heard of in quite a while. Giving up tariffs instead of just freezing them, as some people thought would happen, would have been more positive because it possibly means commerce could pick up, whereas if you just freeze tariffs but don't get rid of them, they're still in the way. But then Reuters reported that there was, quote, fierce resistance, unquote, in the White House to rolling back tariffs on China. And then a top trade advisor told the media that only President Trump could decide to remove tariffs, and there's no agreement to do this at the moment. Then Trump, in remarks to reporters at the White House, poured cold water on the idea of something that he said Beijing would like him to do. This led to the sentiment swings towards the end of the week. So despite some of the enthusiasm we saw earlier this week, it's still too early to get optimistic about the trade war easing back. Nothing is for certain until signatures are on paper. The S&P 500 index might have extended its run above 3,000, but until something solid comes out on a deal between the US and China, it will be very prudent to be very careful about assuming everything is going to be great. It's not an easy road to get to a trade deal, as the last two years have shown. And clearly, there's more to come yet. The Dow was up just a tad to 27,678 on Friday, cementing gains through the week up 1.22% and up 18.6% since January. For much of the day, the Dow was held back by weakness in Boeing after Southwest Airlines said it doesn't expect to be able to fly the 737 MAX planes before March next year and Boeing was off 1.9%. On the other hand, Walt Disney gave the Dow a big boost after reporting strong quarterly results after Thursday's close, and the shares were up more than 3.5% on Friday and added nearly 33 points to the blue chip index. The S&P 500 was up 0.26% to 3,093 and up 23.9% from January. And the Nasdaq Composite added 0.48% to 8,425 and is up 27.3% since the start of the year. Interest rates moved up again with the 10-year Treasury yield up at 1.94%, up from Thursday's 1.92%. And the yield jumped as high as 1.97% on Thursday and that's its highest level since the end of July. Many analysts had expected resistance at the 1.9% level, so the next psychological and technical resistance level is probably right around 2%, a point the 10-year yield hasn't touched on in more than three months. This is a significant change, as just a few weeks ago, a lot of headlines were talking about the chances of recession, and the yield fell below 1.6%. Now the Dow has zoomed straight up for a lot of October and the beginning of November on trade hopes, and yields are on a roll. 
the days of an inverted yield curve possibly hurting bank profits seems like a long time ago. The 10-year yield now enjoys a 25 basis point lead over the 2-year yield and that's the highest level since early this year. So financials might owe some of their solid performance this week to the yield picture. The S&P Financial Index closed a 482.76, up 24.8% year-to-date. And Goldman Sachs, which reported this week, was at 222.91, up 33.4% across the year. These are big moves. That said, pressure on utilities, real estate and some other so-called bond proxy sectors is mounting. These sectors tend to get hurt when Treasury yields rise because some investors might think they can get close to the same yield from fixed income investments as they would from dividends. The volatility index was down 5.18% to 1207 and gold futures was lower at 1459 down 0.47% and down 3.51% over the week. As we discussed a couple of weeks ago, gold looks overdone in the current environment. In oil, the WTI futures moved higher, up 0.48% to 5738 and Bitcoin was down 3.64% to 8861.70. China reported a current account surplus in the third quarter, mainly driven by strong external demands for goods. The surplus in the current account stood at 54.9 billion US dollars in the July to September period, widening from 46.2 billion dollars in the previous quarter. Data from the State Administration of Foreign Exchange showed on Friday. Goods trade posted a surplus of 132.2 billion dollars, while service trade reported a deficit of 72.4 billion dollars. In the first three quarters, China's current account surplus came in at $143.2 billion and the Shanghai Composite was down 0.49% on Friday to 2,664, but is up 18.86% over the year. The US dollar yuan was down 0.25% to 6.9784. Hi, it's Liz Interruption. But if you're getting value from this post and have not done so, please consider subscribing to this channel or ring the bell for custom alerts. Plus, please consider supporting our efforts. You can make a one-off donation via PayPal, here's the link, or subscribe via Patreon for as little as $3 US a month or more to get access to exclusive additional content. Alternatively, you can also donate using Bitcoin. Here is the QR code. The links are in the comments below. I really appreciate your support, which enables us to continue to make more great content. Thanks very much. Now, back to the current show. Turning to the local markets, the RBA released their statement on monetary policy. As the AFR put it, the Reserve Bank of Australia has pushed its timeline for lifting inflation into its 2-3% target range out to 2022 at the earliest, but signalled that further interest rate cuts could backfire in what is a softer economic environment. They downgraded consumption, economic growth and housing investment, but suggested further interest rate cuts, quote, could unintentionally convey an overly negative view of the economic outlook, bringing forward the use of unconventional monetary policy. However, the biggest surprise to economists was the RBA's change in forecasts on both headline inflation and the measure it watches more closely trimmed mean inflation, suggesting that they would only reach 1.9% by June 2021 and stay at that rate to the end of that year. This is down from the RBA's August forecast of hitting 2% by June 2021 and rising to 2.1% by the end of that year. The bank said that some of its economic forecasts imply some progress towards the median term inflation and full employment goals, but this progress is expected to be only gradual. The central bank has changed its language around inflation. After keeping the cash rate on hold at 0.75% this week, it signalled that a return to higher inflation would be achieved over the medium term. Financial markets saw the forecast of a delayed return as further evidence of the need to ease pricing in a 42% chance of a 0.25% reduction in the cash rate in February, up from 36% chance before the Statement on Monetary Policy was released. The bank also slightly softened its view on wage growth, 
suggesting it will be 2.2% for this year, down from 2.3%, and remain at an annual rate of 2.3% for the remainder of the forecast period. Wages growth is low and shows little sign of picking up, the bank said. Faster wages growth would be needed for inflation to be sustainably within the 2-3% target range. This is significant as the bank has been holding out for wages growth as unemployment heads towards 4.5%. But now they're modelling that a 5% sustained depreciation of the Australian dollar would reduce unemployment to, guess what, 4.5% and increase trimmed inflation to 2.25% by the end of 2021. So expect the dollar to be pushed lower. I call this grasping at straws. And CBA's CEO commented that each subsequent interest cut, and arguably having them in relatively quick succession, has probably dented some level of both consumer and business confidence. We agree. Household financial confidence has never been lower. As we discussed in our post, household finance confidence erodes some more. Significantly, all household segments across all states recorded a fall. No wonder retail spending is so weak, as recently reported. Lending for September was up a little, but the media coverage was, well, frankly, over the top. We discussed this in our post. The lending cracks widened in September. In fact, refinance is doing much of the heavy lifting, coupled with first-time buyers, although they were down a little in the month. And investors are still out of the market, according to our latest surveys, which we discussed in our post, home price expectations held up by hot air. According to the SMH, REA Group Chief Executive Owen Wilson has blamed the banking regulator and state governments for intervening in the property boom and causing the most difficult market for real estate sales in decades. APRA looked at the housing market and decided it was getting too hot. They brought in lending restrictions on interest-only loans, investor loans and foreign borrowers, Mr Wilson said adding that state governments had also slugged foreign borrowers with high stamp duties. He also pointed to the impact of the Banking Royal Commission as having spooked lenders into changing their practices and drastically reducing how much they would lend, and the uncertainty of an election as affecting the market. It's about as bad as it can get. It's the worst market we've ever seen, Mr Wilson said. The News Corp controlled property listings portal first quarter trading update on Friday revealed a 9% decline in revenue from broker commissions, which fell to 202.3 million and a 14% fall in earnings before interest, tax and depreciation and amortisation to $114.9 million. National listings fell 15% over the three months to September the 30th, with a 22% drop in Sydney and a 21% decline in Melbourne. That quarter, the fact the residential and development and mortgages declined, to have that kind of perfect storm, we haven't seen within 30 years, he said. REA's share price dropped 2.8% to 103.72. However, Mr Wilson said that to have kept revenue relatively stable in the current environment was a good outcome that met the expectations of most analysts. This was a manufactured downturn, he said. REA Group, which is majority owned by News Corp, laid off 60 staff as part of a restructure in September. The fall in profits for the portal comes as building materials company Borrell also took a hit due to the weak first quarter. But property prices have started a recovery to their fastest growth pace since the boom period of 2015, the SMH said. Most of these things are now unwound, he said. All that uncertainty has gone. And he said the business was seeing a lot of green shoots with buyer activity up more than 30% over October compared to the year before. And the company's mortgage broker business also up for the first time of the year. The buyers are absolutely back, Mr Wilson said. We've clearly bottomed on house prices after four months in a row of increasing house prices. He did not expect to see a major recovery ahead of Christmas, but said he was, quote, pretty confident that there would be some positive signs in the new year. In October, listings declined 15% in Sydney and 70% in Melbourne. REA Group is forecasting lower listings for the first half of 2020 financial year compared to the same period in 2019, with revenues to be skewed towards 
the second half of the year. We, though, watch the construction cycle, which is still heading south, and BIS Oxford Economics has projected that high-rise apartment completions won't bottom out until 2021 to 2022, with Sydney and Melbourne high-rise completions still to fall by 57% in Sydney and 38% in Melbourne from 2018-19 levels. Overlay the rising buyer concerns relating to build quality and the flammable cladding issue and the lack of disclosure, and we think demand will weaken further, so the downtrend in construction could run for longer. That said, Core Logics Index roared away again this week with movements in Sydney and Melbourne strong and some positive signs in the smaller states too, other than Perth, which continues to wilt. To state the obvious again, these high-level indices are not that useful, given 1. the low transaction volumes and 2. the averaging involved. Yes, there are some locations where prices are rising, but others where prices are still falling. And just remember that dwelling values have still fallen by 7.1% since their most recent peak, led by Sydney down 9.9%, Melbourne down 5.5%, and Perth down 21.7%. So we need to keep a sense of proportion. But also from the same source, their data shows low levels of property listings, something that we've been highlighting for some time, and a potential weakening of demand for mortgages. Again, we see this in our data too. So perhaps the pent-up demand has been sated, and if so, then the outlook may be weaker ahead. And auction clearance rates were lower this week with a weighted average of 68%, though Melbourne was down thanks to the long racing weekend. Last year, there were 2,929 listed auctions compared with 1,535 this week, worth again reflecting on the low volumes. And we had the results from NAB, Westpac and ANZ in the past few days, and there is a common story of margin compression, thanks to competition, especially for mortgages, and low interest rates. Higher levels of mortgage defaults, the plus 90-day loans are higher, suggesting more households are getting into trouble, and the large amounts that were put aside for customer remediation, all leading to lower dividends and pressure on capital. Indeed, Westpac went into a brief trading halt ahead of their capital raising announcement. ANZ ended the week at 26.25, down 3.1% over the past month. NAB closed at 28.47, up 1.46% over the month, while Westpac was down to 27.42 and down 3.55% over the past month. CBA, in comparison, who reports on a different cycle, ended at 79.17 and was up 1.27% over the past month. Most of the regionals were also low, but Macquarie Bank, which is a completely different animal, was up to 137.74, and that's up 9.83% in the past month. The financials index overall was at 6,274, and up 1.18% over the past month, while the ASX 100 was at 5,571, up 2.76% over the past month. The Aussie dollar was at 68.57, down 0.57% on Friday, while the euro Aussie dollar was at 1.6072, up 0.36%. The Aussie gold cross was down to 2,127.65, down 4.99% over the past month, while the Aussie Bitcoin cross was at 12,936 and down 4.12% over the past week, but still up 1449 year to date. Finally, before I go, a reminder that the Senate inquiry into the cash transaction ban closes next Friday the 15th of November. I had the chance to discuss this important subject on the ABC, see our post, The Black Economy, QE and Rates on ABC Illawarra. If you want to have your say on the implications for civil liberties, as well as monetary policy, you still have time to make a submission. And mark your diaries as the next DFA Live show is scheduled for Tuesday the 19th of November at 8pm Sydney time, where we'll update our latest scenario analysis and also answer questions live. You can send your questions in beforehand via the DFA blog, links below, or live in the chat room. I look forward to seeing you there. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.